God has delivered us. And we must stand up for him, even in the fire. There's another in the fire. It's a great song, we sang it today. What does it mean? That's what we're gonna look at today. See, there's no other deliverer like Jesus. Last week, we looked at Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter one, when they stood out for their convictions. Today, we're gonna have, have a look at what happened in Daniel chapter three, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are called to stand up. But first of all, what happened in Daniel chapter two? Well, Daniel chapter two was a pretty interesting chapter. Uh, and here's why, because the king started having dreams. Remember, this is crazy Nebuchadnezzar, okay? Not a normal human being. And he has these dreams and he says to all the people who are magicians and wise people in the land, hey, can you interpret my dream? They can't interpret the dream, so he kills them because that's his MO. You, if you can't, look, if you can't meet my need, then I'm just gonna kill you because you're a piece of trash. This is how he thinks. Daniel hears about this, comes running to the king and goes, whoa, 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 time out, big fella. How about you give me a crack at it? See if I can pull it off. He interprets the dream, Nebuchadnezzar, for the second time in two chapters goes, you're amazing. He says, you know what I should do? I should make you ruler over all Babylon. And Daniel goes, thank you very much. And then Daniel says, Shad, actually you probably call them Rack, Shack and Abe, I think. Because Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego probably was hard. Remember they were new names for him. So he probably was like, oh, that's too hard to remember because they used to be called Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. You all remember that? <laughs> Yeah, totally, totally had it nailed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which one was which? Yeah. Um, so, so he makes them the administrators. So Daniel's running Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're now the administrators running Babylon. And uh, it, which is pretty amazing because now they go from being brought in exile to now running the whole place. And it's amazing when things seem to be going really well with God that that is, will be the time when he will allow you to go through the biggest and the hardest test. It's just when you think everything's going well. Now, when Daniel interprets the king's dream in Daniel chapter two, this is what happens. He says, king, here's your dream. And this is what it means. You had a dream that uh, there's a big idol and its head's made of gold, its body's made of iron and bronze and its feet are made of clay. And then the clay feet start to crumble and the whole thing falls over. That's your kingdom, O king. Uh, you think it's gonna rain forever, but eventually it's gonna crumble and you're gonna be gone, which is a pretty bold dream to tell somebody, right? <laughs> but he does it. And we don't know the time period between Daniel chapter two and Daniel chapter three. We don't know. But by the time we get to Daniel chapter three, the king has decided I'm gonna build an idol that will last forever. That's what I'm gonna do. You know what, Daniel, I know you told me that your God said that my kingdom is not gonna last forever, but I have got a better plan. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm going to build an idol that's made out of solid gold, no feet of clay, and it's gonna be 90 feet tall. These ceilings are 26 feet tall, okay? So imagine three times the size of that and then nine feet wide, made of solid gold. Nebuchadnezzar did what many people still do today. When God says, I want you to do it this way, they go, uh, no, you see, I'm a control freak. How many control freaks? You can self-confess. Just be honest, Jesus is watching. You can't lie. You're a control freak. And see, and what happens when you're a control freak is you go, oh no, I know you're God of the universe, creator and all that. And like, I wouldn't be here without you, but I've got a better plan. <laughs> yeah. So here's what happened. Let's see. Let, let, let's see how this plays out for Nebuchadnezzar as well as the three of them. So this idol is made and then we read in Daniel 3 verse 4. To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations and languages, that at the time that you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image and, uh, that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Because <laughs> there's always a... There's always an, this is going to happen to you if you don't do what I say with Nebuchadnezzar. So uh, 
That's a pretty great incentive for worship, isn't it? You will worship me or you will die. Jesus said, receive my free gift, which I paid for, or you'll die. It's a big difference. I'm so glad we're not forced to worship God. I'm glad that we get to worship God after we accept his free gift of salvation. But I think just like these three men, the world says to us, bow down and worship what we worship, otherwise we'll destroy you. Do you know last year, 4,305 Christians were martyred for their faith in this world. But even if we aren't martyred physically, our characters will be assassinated, our reputations will be destroyed, our integrity will be undermined, all because we refuse to worship what the world worships. And if you aren't solid in your convictions, which honour God and point people to Jesus, you will end up being like everybody else in this story who just went along with it. So the day comes when Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they're there and they choose not to bow down. The king doesn't see them, but some of the locals do see them and they dob them in, they tell on them. They're like, yeah, no, no, you, you, know, you know the Jews that you put in charge of all of us? Yeah, yeah, totally didn't bow down. This doesn't go down so well. They didn't lodge a formal protest, the three of them. They didn't do that. They simply refrained from bowing down. They, their, their actions were interesting because they, they weren't public as in they were trying to make a public statement, but their actions weren't hidden. So, so they, made, they made bold statements, but they didn't just go and proclaim, hey, the reason we're not standing, the reason we're not, the, I'm telling you, all of you who can see us, they didn't do that, they just stood there. Everybody else bowed down, they just stood. This, is this, hopefully this is giving you some tips for like how we're meant to handle ourselves when we want to stand up. So, Matthew 5, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let me tell you that you will not be able to go through life without being discovered as a Christ follower. Why? Because a candle that has been lit can never be hidden. So the true test of these three men is about to come. See, they'd already decided to stand up, but now they're about to be brought before Nebuchadnezzar and he's going to ask them a very important question, a question that you and I get asked all the time. Then Nebuchadnezzar, verse 13, in rage and fury gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And they brought the three men before the king and Nebuchadnezzar spoke and he said, is it true? Mm? <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up. Now, if you are ready at the time that you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre and psaltery and symphony with all kinds of music and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not, then you will be cast immediately into the midst of the burning fire and who is the God that will deliver you from my hands? It's one thing to stand up for God. It's another thing to stick to your stand when somebody says, is it true? Yeah. See, we all know how that played out with Peter. Peter was like, Jesus, I will never deny you. I promise I'll never deny you. I never do. Then, you know, the first opportunity, you know, aren't you one of Jesus' followers? No, 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 definitely not me. Another one? No, no, definitely not me. It's not easy to stand up when you've been called out but it's what Jesus did so we must do it for him Charles Spurgeon said this he's a, a preacher from a hundred years ago he said if standing before the heart searching God at this time you cannot say it is true how should you act if you cannot say that you take Christ's cross and are willing to follow him at all hazards, then hearken to me and learn the truth. Do not make a profession at all. 
Do not talk about baptism or the Lord's Supper, nor of joining a church, nor of even being a Christian. For if you do, you will lie against your own soul. If it be not true that you renounce the world's idols, do not profess that it is so. It is unnecessary that a person should profess to be what they are not, and it is a sin. If you cannot be true to Christ, if your coward heart is cowardly to the Lord, then do not profess to be his disciple, I beseech you. He that is married to the world or hard-hearted had better return to his house for he is of no service in this war. That's what it means when you and I get asked, is it true? Come on, I'm telling you, the only way, the only way that you and I can fight for Jesus is to stand up. And when somebody asks us, is it true? You have to stay standing. Ephesians 6.13, therefore take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. We must never stop standing. We can stop other things, but we can never stop standing for God and standing for Jesus. So I wanna ask you right now in this room, who will stand for Jesus? Jesus, right now, will you stand for Jesus? Who will stand for Jesus? You right now, are you ready to say, I will stand for Jesus. I will say, you're not caring about other people. You're standing for Jesus. And if you can't do it in here in church, you're never gonna do it in your workplace. You're never gonna do it in some other public arena. You've gotta be able to stand up for Jesus and say, I stand for Jesus because He stood for you. He stood for me on a cross with nails in His arms and nails in His legs. And He died a painful, miserable death for you and for me so that we can stand and say, I stand for Jesus. Come on, thank you, Jesus. You can be seated. Look, standing up for Jesus doesn't mean that God is gonna stop you going through trials. It means that when you go through the trials, He'll be with you in it. And that these three men, they knew that. And when they said, they were challenged by Nebuchadnezzar, They said, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case and you throw us into the fire, our God whom we serve, he's able to deliver us from this burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, but even if he doesn't do that, Let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. You see, they knew God's power. They also knew that they had to do what was right, even if God did not do what they hoped he would do. See, we so often complain about what's fair. It's not fair. This is not fair. This is not fair. It's not fair. But it's better for us to make a stand in the midst of what's not fair and leave our fate in God's hands. See, these three men never doubted God's ability, but neither did they ever presume to know his will. Job, Job said this in Job 13, though God may slay me, yet will I trust him. Would you trust God if God chose to slay you? You, you, you see, this, this is what we're faced with. They recognise that God's plan might be different from their desires. I've had my own dreams and desires since I was a kid. And I pray that God continues to fulfil them. But if He doesn't, I can't turn my back on Him. I dreamt when I was a kid that I'd be a pilot. I would look at planes in the sky and I think, oh, it'd be so great to escape. And if you were a pilot, you could escape. Wouldn't that be amazing to escape? That's what I used to think as a kid. And then, and then God said, oh, no, 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 you've got a great personality for being a CPA. <laughs> so that's what he made me do. And then I was a CEO and I'm still not a pilot. You see, it doesn't matter what our desires are. It matters what God's desires for us are. See, many people today love Jesus. And they think highly of Jesus, but they're a long way from God. And I'll tell you why. Because they worship the world and they still love the things of this world. 1 John 2, do not love the world or the things in this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said, let it be known to you, O king, that we won't do this. That took a massive amount of faith. But they'd already been tested in Daniel chapter one. See, God, God, God doesn't just test you once. You're gonna go through a series of tests. Maybe your whole life and my whole life will be a series of tests until we get to heaven. But unfortunately, many people fail in their obedience because they're waiting for something big to test their faith before they actually start to obey God. Some people fill their whole lives with lots of little small compromises. But they tell themselves, you know, but when it really matters, when I get asked whether Jesus is Lord or not, that's, I'll stand for that though. I'll totally stand for that. But yeah, you know, these other things. They, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego had no excuses, none. Not a hint. They could have said, think of all the things that those three men could have said. They could have said, look, there's nothing to be gained by resisting. Uh, we can actually do more if we live. So let's not sacrifice ourselves because we could do more for God. In other words, they come up with a noble God plan that's different to what God wants. They could have said, look, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. You know what I mean? It's their custom to bow down. So look, let's just bow down. What's the big deal? They could have said, uh, oh man, if we do that, we're going to lose everything we have. Do you know often when, when you know I see this a lot with Christians. They, they love God. They serve Jesus. They put God first in every area, including their finances, and they get blessed. And all of a sudden they start worshipping the blessing. And the good things that God's given them, now that becomes their idol. And they don't want to give it up. And they're like, oh, no, 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 I, I like this blessing. And they start idolizing that. They could have said, well, look, everybody else is doing it. No, it takes bravery and courage to not do what everybody else is doing. They could have said, well, it's only, it's only once. It's only for like 10 minutes. Let's just bow down. What does it make any difference if we do it for 10 minutes? Listen, let me tell you something. These men knew that 10 minutes could change an entire life. And I will tell you today that 10 minutes could change your eternity. They could have said, God would never expect us to do this. There's no way the God we serve would ask us to do this. God understands our struggle with sin. Of course he does. That's why he made provision at the cross for us to be set free from sin. But let me tell you this, knowing that God understands should be a spur to obedience, not a license to sin. So what happened to these three men when they refused the angry king? What happened? Well, they're wrapped in clothes the fire gets turned up even hotter than it was before. And then they get thrown into this fire. Now the fire's so hot that the people who throw them in die. So, so, like, so that's how hot it is. Then, then something amazing happens. Guess, guess what? Can you guess what happens? Guess who shows up 600 years before he was born in Bethlehem? Jesus. Jesus turns up. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose in haste and spoke and he said to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? And they answered and said to the king, true, O king, which is where that saying comes from. Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they're not hurt. And the fourth of the, for the form of the fourth is like the son of God. Boom, there's Jesus. Mic drop moment. All of a sudden, here he is, Saviour. And you know the amazing thing? We don't even know and we won't know. We don't know whether Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego even knew that he was in the fire with them. We don't know. And let, let me tell you, sometimes you'll know that Jesus is with you through the fire and other times you won't know. But regardless of whatever you're going through, he's always with you. Always. Come on, you've got to get excited about that. So Nebuchadnezzar calls them out of the fire and he's, he's, he's blown away and he says, I make a decree that any people, nation or language which speaks anything amiss about the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego shall be cut into pieces and their houses shall be made an ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. 
that's probably actually not what they wanted him to say. Because that, that was his MO, do what I say or I'll kill you. So now he's pivoted and said, no, now worship the God of Israel or I'll kill you. And they're probably going, uh, no, that's kind of not how he works. But, but bless your heart. That, that was the bless your heart Nebuchadnezzar moment. Oh, bless his heart. He, he means will. See, the only reason this happened was not just because they stood out, not just because they were determined to stand up, but because they were determined to still stand. So what will you and I stand up for? This is a golden question for us in the world in which we live right now today. What should we make a stand and stand up for? Let me tell you, make it easy for you. Anything that is a commandment of God in the Bible anything. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John were told, so they called them and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. Whether, for we cannot speak, but of the things that we have seen and heard. In Acts chapter 5, they went on and said, listen, we ought to obey God rather than men when it comes to preaching the gospel. Our filter is this, if the laws of the land and the laws of men are contrary to the word of God, it is the word of God for which we must make a stand. And one day somebody will listen to this message which will be broadcast on media and I will get in trouble for saying that. Now this is not always as simple as you may think it is and I'll tell you why. Because we have a great way of making things seem rational or not. Let me give you an example. There is a law in this country that I guarantee 99.99% of you do not know about. But it's a law and I would like to know how many of you would abide by it. Let me tell you what the law is. If you go to the city of Hartford, Connecticut, it is illegal as a man to kiss your wife on a Sunday. You're not allowed to. It's been there for 300 years. However long Hartford has been, been a city for, I have no clue. I'm not pretending to know. So we would go, well, that's kind of, obviously, I'm going to kiss my wife on Sunday. That's a bit of a crazy. See, it's not always clean cut. Philippians 3.20 tells us that our citizenship is in heaven. We are citizens of this world, but this is temporary. Our citizenship is in heaven. Remember, most of the 12 disciples did not have a Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego experience. They actually were martyred for their confession of faith. They didn't get saved. But when we stand up for Jesus, Jesus stands up for us. Jesus said in Matthew 5, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you. Say all kinds of evils against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your ward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets before you. Look, we are put in a very difficult situation right now and we will continue to be where we have to, we have to measure Romans 13, which tells us that we need to obey those in authority over us but it must be done in the light of Romans 12. Romans 12 says this, I urgently and fervently ask you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Whatever we take a stand for must be something that is in line with the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Not our will, His will. That's what Jesus said. Not my will, yours be done. That's our statement right now. That's the challenge for us. We have our convictions. And we need to stand up for Jesus. And it's not easy right now. And I don't think, to be honest with you, it's going to get easier. I think it's only going to get harder. So I think this is a time for us to actually start to make a decision and say, okay, 
how are we going to handle this? Well, some, some of you need to pivot. Some of you, some of you just got it, you know, like you've had a foot in both camps. Okay, you've got to work out where you stand. Some of you need to pivot on what you're standing up and standing out for. Because you're standing up and standing out for the wrong things. And the things that you should be standing up and standing out for, you're not. That's between you and the Holy Spirit. I don't want to get involved in that. Don't send, don't send me emails saying, hey, but I think we should be doing this, this, and this, and this. Because there's not enough hours between now and when Jesus comes back for me to read every one of your emails. Nor to watch every YouTube video that you want me to watch. Okay, can't do it. Much as I love you sending them to me, I just can't do it. But here's the reality. We have to choose. We have to choose. And I just think, I think this time is a time for us to embrace the choice. I, I think there's many of us right now that we're, we're in a time in history and like, man, I just can't wait for things to go back to normal. I don't think they're going to. I think we're just going to continue to evolve into a new normal. And we, and we have to learn how to adapt. We have to learn how to make new decisions. What is our lens? What's our process? What's our filter? Well, let me tell you this so it's very clear and it's very easy. Our filter is Jesus and the Word of God. That's it. Keep, keep it simple. Keep it real. As Pastor Clinton says, where is he? He says, keep it 100 And the only way that you can do that is that you need to be right with Jesus first before you can live and stand for him. So would you bow your heads and close your eyes because I want to give people an opportunity right now to receive Jesus, to accept his free offer of salvation right now this morning so that you can guarantee your citizenship in heaven. Listen, can I tell you, I can tell you with absolute surety that you will die one day. Guaranteed, it's going to happen to you and to I. And I don't want you to wait until that dying moment to work out what you think is going to happen to you after you die. I want you to have a surety. And I can tell you that I know the only way that can happen is for you to accept the free gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. That's it. If you confess Jesus with your mouth, if you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10. So right now, every head closed, every, every, every eye closed, every head bowed, right now. If you want to give your life to Jesus, nobody's looking around, not going to embarrass you. We do this in our church all the time. Just lift your hand right now. Say, yeah, I need Jesus. I need you. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Just lift your hand. Say, yeah, I need Jesus today. I need Jesus. I see your hand at the back. I see your hand. Come on. We can get excited, church. People's lives and eternities are being changed right now. They're being changed. Is there anybody else? Make it right today. Make it right today. Jesus died 2,000 years ago so you can make it right today. Anybody else? Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else? Okay, well, every head is bowed and every eye is closed. I want those people that raise their hand as, long as, as well as everybody else in this room who's a part of the family of God to pray this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. I repent of my sin. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Please come into my heart today. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Amen. Church, can we stand and thank the Lord for lives changed this morning?